Welcome to English Language Arts and Critical Pedagogy, hosted by Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity, or Branch Ed. My name is Kim Igwe, and I am the Professional Learning Associate in the Birch Center here at Branch Ed. Thanks for joining us. We're honored to have each of you here today. I know you're eager to hear from Dr. Myers, so we're going to get started quickly after my brief intro. Please note that there will be time for questions and answers at the end of today's presentation. If you have questions as Dr. Myers is presenting, please put them in the chat and we'll have time at the end for her to answer those questions. I encourage you all to type your questions as we go. And um, I, that makes it easier for you to engage a little bit, but also, um, you know, pop those questions in and it makes it to where we can interact with one another. And I'm hoping I can get to all your questions at the end. I'm beyond excited to be here with you all today. Working in a teacher education department and with accreditation and assessment, I do a lot of, a little bit of everything, but I miss my ELA people. I miss these components that make up um, literacy. And so I'm really excited to be with you all today. Uh, I'm hoping that you can all see my screen. Um, I am a visual person. I engage more when there are visuals in front of me. And so I wanted to first kind of give you our learning objectives. Like what are we even gonna be talking about for the next 30 or 40 minutes? And so there are three big things. Uh, when it comes to English language arts and critical pedagogy, we have this beautiful merging of critical literacy. And that's where I want our focus to be today. And when I teach my courses, I like to focus a lot on the what, the so what, and the now what. This really helps guide are learning together. And so that's what we'll be doing. So the first part of this presentation will be about just identifying the what, defining critical literacy. And I plan on trying to offer lots of resources, no matter if you're a newbie or if you are a veteran to the idea of critical literacy. Then uh, we're gonna work on our so what. So I will share with you my so what, but I also want you to start thinking about your own so what. And your so what is definitely explored and defined and categorized by your own place and space because we all have a different so what for our students. And then lastly, we'll talk about the now what. How do we actually start planning out and looking at ways to revise the curriculum? And I have three approaches that I want to offer you. So the first thing I wanted to throw out is my why. Um, I think it's always important for us to talk about the fact that our academics, our research, our teaching goals never happen in a vacuum. We can't separate our lived experiences from who we are. And so my why starts when I was really young, my personal why, I went to a very urban school and shifted um, later towards high school to a very rural school, very rural school. And I was able to see firsthand the lack of resources, the hidden curriculum. Um, I even had one of my grad professors once tell me, um, oh, you'll never make it in PhD school because you went to an urban elementary and you didn't get the foundations that you needed early. And I was like, oh, okay, well, watch me. Um, and so I've gotten to see how there are huge resources gaps, especially in these two areas of education. Um, additionally, I became a very young mother at the age of 16, and my child was transformative for me, um, but also being able to see how important it is for a student to feel empowered. There were very many teachers who saw that in me and saw the need for me to feel empowered and not ashamed and not scared of my future when I became a young mother and graduated high school with a two-year-old on my hip. And one of those teachers was actually my history teacher, not my English teacher. I loved my English teachers, but my history teacher actually gave me a copy of The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. And I was so irritated because it was so much harder than the other books the other students had been assigned to do their reading on. But he told me he felt like I could handle it. And when I read The Jungle, it was one of the first times I realized that words have power, that words can bring justice into our world. And so it kind of derailed that functional literacy that I had experienced so much. And now reading and writing had a purpose for me and really gave me that goal and really made me want to go to college and believe in myself. 
Additionally, my why is backed by my professional experiences. I taught freshman composition very early while I was working on a master's degree. And I was frustrated because so many of my students did not have the reading, the writing skills, the speaking skills that they needed. And when I would sit down and talk with them, they would share with me similar experiences that I had found where lots of times they were just pushed through the system. And maybe they were able to get a scholarship to go to college. They got accepted to a college, but they were not prepared for that. And so that was a main thing for me. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to go be a K through 12 public school warrior. And I was an ELA teacher for um, 10 years. And I learned a lot about the difference between functional literacy and critical literacy, where we're not just training uh, students to become in the job field. We're trying to transform them and transform our society for the better. Uh, I also got to work at the K-20 Center for Education and Community Renewal, and this was a fabulous experience for me. It was grant funded, but I was able to go back into the urban school district that I grew up in and do work with the teachers and students there. And that was an amazing opportunity to have that difference. So now here I am, I'm a teacher educator. Um, I'm no longer teaching K through 12, I'm teaching our future teachers. And I think that is one of the reasons why critical literacy has become so much more important to me now is seeing how we want to prepare our students who are going to be teachers to make an impact and have that ripple effect. So I promised you I was gonna start with the what. So let's first define what critical literacy is. And I am basing my definition of critical literacy on Paula Ferreri. And this really revolves around pushing back against that banking model, that banking model where we're just inserting knowledge into their brains based on what we feel like is most important. This really critical literacy is a push against functional literacy, but it's also a way for us to break down the four walls of the classroom and bring the world into the classroom to embrace our students lived experiences and embrace our youth for the power that they have that the intelligence that they have that the creative the resourcefulness that they have and really look at the world around them so we're no longer reading and writing speaking and listening and doing all those things in a vacuum we're bringing in those social cultural and political texts and context because nothing was written in a vacuum and we're also engaging in those dialogical and reciprocal exchanges. That's one reason why I, I love teaching still to this day. Research is important, but teaching I learn so much because I'm learning from my students as much as they're learning from me. And so the last component of this is about empowerment. It's about creating agency in our students or allowing them to see their own agency that they have. And it's meant to be transformative individually, but also for our communities. It's not just a test score, essentially. So that is how I define critical literacy using Ferrari's model. So let's talk about real quickly what it is not. Um, it often gets confused with the concept or the idea of critical thinking. And critical thinking is a part of it. We want our students to be able to analyze and evaluate. But again, we're not doing that just within an academic bubble. We are engaging with the social political. We are allowing our young people to organically build the curriculum with us. We're allowing them to take a spotlight and interrogate a text. And so it goes beyond just critical thinking. The critical component of this is really learning how to question and to think outside of the pages of the text. So for me as a scholar and a teacher educator, it's really important for me when I want to revise a course to know where to start. And sometimes that's hard. And if I don't have someone guiding me to the seminal scholars and the contemporary scholars, I lose a lot of time. So I wanted to not only offer you the definition, but I wanted to also offer you kind of the springboard, if you will, to some of the scholars that are out there who've done the work and who are doing the work. Um, 
And this is going to be provided for you in a resource guide at the end. So you can take a screenshot of it if you want, but I'm also going to provide this list to you. So in the middle of this graphic, where you have the triangle and the little parts coming off of it, those are our seminal critical literacy scholars. We start with Freire and we move into Giraud and Hooks and Vygotsky and McLaren and Langshire. And those people are building the foundation for us. And then on the outskirts of this model or this graphic are some of your more contemporary scholars. These are people who are doing the work still right now. A lot of them are engaged in social media. My teacher education students get so incredibly excited when they follow Antero Garcia or um, an Ernest Morel on Twitter and get to follow them and see how they think and see resources that they're sharing. And when one of those scholars gets excited about another new scholar who's just entering the field, this is wonderful for them. So this graphic is useful to me when I'm trying to revise a course with a certain end in mind. Um, but I think it's also important for our students because a huge component of critical literacy is encouraging our students to think about who is included, who is represented in what we're reading and who is not represented in what we're reading. And so we want to offer a very well-rounded representation in the scholars. Um, I always say it's incredibly important that our students not just see themselves in the data, but it's important for ourselves, our students to see themselves within the scholars, within the writing itself. And so, Again, this gives a framework, not only for you as scholars, but also for those of you who might be teacher educators. And for those of you who are K through 12 teachers, these contemporaries are incredibly accessible and incredibly useful. And again, I'm gonna provide some more for you in the resource guide at the end. So I've kind of given you a foundation of what critical literacy is. And now we're gonna talk about the so what behind it. Like, why is any of this important at all? And so the first thing that I'm going to put at you is the national standards. And I'm gonna put that at you with um, kind of a disclaimer. I don't ever want us to be doing literacy with our students because of government standards or because of these kind of colonized approaches to teaching, right? Um, I am a huge fan of teaching as a transformative activity that we want to transform our students. However, as a K through 12 teacher, I have been in your shoes and I know what it's like to want to teach a certain way and your administration be like, yeah, but how is that meeting the standards, right? And so I'm offering you some national standards. And not only does this happen in K through 12, but this also happens at the college level, um, especially in teacher ed departments where it's incredibly important that we are including the standards in our syllabi and that type of stuff. So I am including for you the NCTE standards and the ILA standards in our resource guide. They will be provided for you. But NCTE specifically talks about the importance of criticality in our methods courses. So if you're teaching a methods course for secondary ELA or elementary ELA, it's important that it's there. And ILA also has statements on criticality and critical pedagogy and critical literacy. So they are there to um, defend you, to be your allies when you need to pull resources to support that. I can think of a specific time at a university that I used to work at where I wanted to start embedding more critical literacy into the ELA methods courses. And I received a little bit of pushback and I was able to pull these standards as evidence. And maybe that's, you know, now being assistant director of assessment and accreditation, I understand sometimes we have to learn the language to play the game. And that's kind of what we do with these national standards. Another so what for me. So remember I told you that you have to find your so what for your place in space. Well, my place in space right now is Texas. And so when we look at the K through 12 education, some of the more recent demographics, we can see the breakdown of those demographics in our schools. And we know that there are shifting demographics in the schools in Texas, but the teacher demographics have hardly changed at all. 
And we know that a lot of times our future teachers teach the way that they were taught. And so it's incredibly important that we embed these critical literacy components. So our underserved populations of students can have some type of access to critical literacy. We know the hidden curriculum is real. We know classes and schools that are heavily students of color are not getting that high level, those high expectations, those support for creativity and resourcefulness. And so it's incredibly important that this is happening in K through 12, but it's also happening in teacher education. And you can see the mismatch here when we have the demographics on the left of the students, the K through 12 students in Texas, but then we look at their ACT benchmarks where they're meeting at least three or more benchmarks and there's a massive gap. So we can't just skim over that and pretend like it doesn't exist. We have to ask ourselves why. I pulled the ACT benchmarks for you again, but I'm also adding the SAT benchmarks because I know that this is a national webinar and I know not everybody does AT, ACT. There's also the SAT. And we are also seeing these gaps and we often hear them referred to as an achievement gap. But if we really do some critical reflection, if we really dive in, we know that this is not achievement gaps, that these are resource gaps. These are often a mismatch in the achievements in our schools that are serving our marginalized students. And so we want to make sure that we are um, collecting and developing strategies for the classroom that help prepare our students to compete no matter what, to feel empowered no matter what, to fill that strength in their own abilities. And so that is another reason why my So What revolves around critical literacy. Another thing that we're seeing in Texas right now is the increase in our underserved population. So you can see that between 2009 and more recent years, we've had a 36% increase in our English language learners, a 16% increase in our economically disadvantaged, our 32% special education and our 57% increase in our immigrant and refugee students. So it's important more now than ever that we are supporting those students again, that we are not using education as a weapon to oppress, that we are using education as a tool to emancipate, like Ferrari would tell us. I know that sometimes when we use those types of demographics, it seems like we are looking at it through a deficit lens as opposed to an asset lens. But I see these changes in demographics as a huge asset. We have the opportunity now to have a more well-rounded experience in the classroom because our students are bringing various lived experiences into the classroom. And we can engage those as an asset approach that we can use them to construct knowledge together at the classroom, social and within our community. And again, we have to remember, it's important that we know these facts about our students. We, it's important that we know our, our so what, because we want the education that is happening within our institutions to function as freedom and not conformity. That the sit and get, that the functional literacy, that the drill and kill, all those things are not supporting our students to feel empowered and move beyond the classroom with their knowledge. So I want you also to take into consideration your so what, and another so what that I have to consider is that I currently work at a Hispanic serving institute. And there are lots of times that I'm like, how are we serving? Where's the serving part of that? How are we serving our Hispanic students? And while we might not always practice critical literacy, maybe it's talked about, but are we practicing what we preach? As an HSI, are we encouraging our students to confront injustices? Are we encouraging our students to to interrogate systematic oppression? Are we encouraging our students to take the context of the world around them and apply it to their learning so they feel empowered and not just like we are conforming them to some image? So that is another component of my so what. So now I want you to take just a, a few moments to consider 
your so what? What is your so what? And it helps me sometimes to have some reflective questions, some prompts, right? So when you teach English, you always want your students to have a prompt to help guide them. And so in front of you, I have six reflective questions. I would love for you to take a moment to just pick the one you feel the most drawn to. And I'd love for you to jot it down on scrap paper or in your Google Doc or whatever you're using. And I want you to use that kind of as your springboard, your jumping off point. I'm a huge fan of starting points. We cannot begin the journey unless we have a starting point. And sometimes the journey will take us places that are completely unexpected, right? Um, I have a tattoo, you can't see it. Yes, you can, maybe just a little. I have a tattoo of an arrow on my arm. And one of the reasons I have that is because my grandmother used to always remind me that before an arrow can um, be propelled forward, it has to go backwards. And for me in my own life, my starting point sometimes was moving backwards instead of forward. And sometimes it might feel that way when we ask ourselves the difficult questions, when we engage in real critical reflection as educators. But overwhelmingly, the research out there tells us that some of the most culturally responsive educators are wonderful at engaging in critical reflection. And so these are some critical reflection questions for you. So I'm gonna just give you a minute, I'm gonna zip it, I'm gonna be quiet. And I'm gonna let you pick one of these questions to jot down or consider. But at the end of the session, I am going to provide you all six questions in your resource guide. So take just a minute to look at these and pick the one that's really um, speaking to you in this moment. Okay, so hopefully you had some time to at least kind of peruse those and, and maybe connect with the one that's speaking to you the most, because I really want you to be thinking about your so what before we dive into the now what, okay? So again, these questions will be provided to you in the resource guide at the end of the presentation. So let's start looking at the know what now, okay? So Ferrari reminds us about the importance of practice. We should never have actions without well thought out theories. And we should never have theory without taking some kind of action. So I'm, for our now what, the first thing that I'm going to do is give you three different theoretical frameworks. These are going to be the conceptual component. How do I begin? How do I start building this course? How do I start making revisions to my curriculum? How do I develop a professional development, right? Any, any component or as an administrator, how do I support my educators? And so I'm going to give you three different approaches for doing that. All of them revolve around English language arts and critical pedagogy. Then we will shift to the more tangible, the concrete, some learning strategies that help support the theoretical. So starting with the theory and moving into action because we should never have one without the other. So frameworks make the dream work for me. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. That might not be the case with you. Everybody functions differently, but I'm sharing with you what works for me. Anytime I'm building a new class, anytime I'm diving in deep to revise my curriculum, I use a framework to do so. It really helps me make sure that I am meeting the criteria of the concept that I want to do. What we see, especially, so when it comes to like culturally responsive teaching, we see in the research, there are so many teachers who say, yes, I believe it, I have that mindset, I wanna do it. Um, and then when we see them in the classroom, they're not actualizing culturally responsive teaching. The theory is there, but they're not actualizing it. And so one of the ways for me that has been helpful to make sure I'm actualizing the concept, the theoretical concept that I want to actualize is by using a framework. And so I'm going to offer three of them to you. Um, and we're gonna start off kind of smaller. So remember I told you that I've got some things for the newbies, some things for the veterans. Um, my son plays Minecraft like 
constantly. And so you would be noobs in his world. And so for the noobs, I start off kind of with a smaller framework. Um, and that doesn't mean it's simple, but it is a little smaller. And then we'll shift into more complex, um, more in-depth frameworks for those of you who might be like, okay, I already know what critical literacy is. I've kind of already been doing it. What you got for me? So I want to make sure I got something for everybody who's involved. So the first one that we're going to talk about are the four dimensions of critical literacy. And these were created by Lewis and Harst. And again, resource is going to be provided for you in the resource guide. So don't panic. Um, I do got you covered on that one. And this is made up mostly of four components. And this was a really good starting point for me as an educator, or if I'm working with brand new teachers in the field who are like, yes, I've heard about this critical literacy. I really want to do it. Where do I begin? And sometimes when we take a big abstract theoretical concept, it's easier to break it down into smaller components. And so my own students have shared with me that this has been really useful for them. So the first step is disrupting the commonplace then considering multiple viewpoints, then focusing on the socio-political and then promote taking action to promote social justice, right? Um, these can be done in a linear fashion if that's what works best for you and works best for your students, but they don't have to be in a linear fashion. Um, a linear fashion. Um, I often refer to frameworks kind of like a casserole when all the separate ingredients are there they're fine and dandy, but when you mix those ingredients together, you have the most amazing, comforting, grandmother created casserole, right? And nobody, nobody cooks like her. And she has perfected this over time. It's been in the family forever. So, but she can do it different ways. She can add ingredients at different times. She knows what works for her. And so you need to find what works for you. And so these are four components that just make it easy to break critical literacy down into a way that I can, when I'm building my curriculum, I can look at my curriculum and say, okay, have I focused on the socio-political or have I left that off? How often have I done that? Is that something I need to hit harder? Or maybe I haven't disrupted the commonplace very often. Like we're still doing these traditional text on paper essays. Maybe I need to mix it up a little bit and incorporate some digital storytelling. Maybe I need to decolonize some of this um, readings that we're doing and add in a lot more representation and different types of genres and things that aren't considered a part of the traditional canon, right? Um, and then I can always ask myself, okay, so I have supported my students in disrupting the commonplace. I've supported them in considering multiple viewpoints. We have focused on learning about the social political. Now it's time for us to learn to take action. Because again, Ferrari says we shouldn't have theory without taking some kind of action. And so we want our students to feel supported in that. And so this particular framework is a really good starting point for that. The next framework is by Goldie Muhammad, and I fangirl over Goldie so hard. Um, I absolutely love this framework, this model, um, with the five different branches of culturally and responsive, um, culturally and historically responsive literacy. Um, my students are learning about this, and again, they said it just helps so much when they're building lesson plans to make sure that they are incorporating these five different components into those lesson plans. Because again, how do we know we're doing critical literacy unless we have some kind of framework to question ourselves and to interrogate ourselves because that's what we're asking students to do with critical literacy. So we need to be doing that with ourselves. And criticality is built into this, but there are also all different components that go into it. Identity, students' identity. We should never leave their identities out of the curriculum. We should always embed that. And we also need to be aware of the fact of if we're including identity, are we only looking at the oppressive components of the identity or are we also looking at the victorious moments of the identity? Also, are we allowing them the space to explore their own identities or do we already come in with assumptions about their identities? Um, skills is another component. I love this framework because we are reminded here that our job is to educate, that we want to educate, um, and, but we're not educating within a vacuum. So it's still important that we learn skills, that we still learn things like figurative language, that we still learn how to write a thesis statement, those types of things, but we're embedding it 
also and merging it with the identity of our students and who they are as an individual, but also as a community. Intelligence is another component, and that's kind of more of that critical thinking skills. Are we just encouraging our students to memorize facts and regurgitate them onto a test, or are we helping them learn their own intelligence, constructing knowledge that they can use? We don't want them to just absorb we want them to be creators also um, in the assessment field oftentimes we'll say that schools are data rich but information poor and on top of it we're also even more intelligence poor so we take the data we develop information and then we use our intelligence to do something with it right and then we have the criticality part looking at things with a critical lens recognizing whose voices are represented and whose voices are not represented and how are they represented and why were they represented that way. And then we also have the joy aspect. What components of this concept can you find joy within? If we're doing poetry, where is the joy in the poetry? Where is the joy in your own community through poetry? Where is the joy in your own indiv individuality within poetry? So, this particular framework for me has been really useful for helping my teacher ed students develop their lesson plans. The third one that I'm going to offer you, I promise, you know, we've got, you know, if you are a veteran and you're ready for that deeper dive, then we have the synthesis model. And the synthesis model is exactly that. We're taking the components, so a critical literacy framework, which is domination, access, diversity, and design but we're synthesizing all those things together. So kind of let me explain how this graphic works. I tried to create something that would kind of help you process that information. So we see the first column is domination. And then you see the word to the left that says without. So domination without access maintains the occlusion, exclusionary force of dominant discourses. Domination without diversity loses the ruptures that produce contestation and change. Domination without design does not deconstruct dominance or reconstruct human agency. So that's how you read the synthesis model. So again, if we go to the access column, we can say access without domination, theories of domination leads to naturalization and powerful discourses and how they came to power. So we're not only looking at um, for a model, we need to include domination, access, diversity, and de design. We also need to consider how those things relate to one another, how those things impact one another, or the lack of those things. What kind of environment does that create for the learning that's happening in our classes? So the synthesis model is a little more complex and it guides you a little bit more, but it's also a really good way as a critical reflection for us as educators to be like, yes, I'm including diversity, yes. But we know that that can sometimes be a buzzword and be used in a really, really superficial way. So yes, I'm including diversity, but am I including diversity while also examining domination? Or am I only doing diversity in an additive approach? Which James Banks tells us, if you're only doing diversity in a superficial, let's look at the celebrations, then you're doing it in a way that makes diversity exclusive and not inclusive. You're doing more damage to students than not including anything at all. And so we want to make sure that we are including diversity, but we're also doing a deep examination of domination and how that plays a role in diversity. So that's how you work through the synthesis model. And again, these things will be provided to you in the resource guide. So you have those three frameworks. You were promised three approaches to your English language, arts, and critical pedagogy. And so those were the three approaches that you can take when you're building a course or revising a curriculum. And so we move from foundation to now design, like how do I actually start making some changes in the classroom itself? And so we move from the conceptual to the tangible, right? And I want you to think about um, these frameworks like a foundation. What happens 
to a house that is built on a weak foundation. If you studied the Bible, you know, but also if you live in Texas, you know, because we got a lot of shifting foundations in Texas. And so the rest of the building is not sound. The walls, the windows, we see cracks, all kinds of issues start to develop if the foundation is not sound. And so when it comes to your ELA curriculum, you want to make sure the foundation is sound before you just start diving into classroom activities. So again, the framework is your foundation, then the windows and the doors and the decor um, are the things that are happening in the classroom, the learning activities, the instructional strategies that you use. And so I am offering to you some of the instructional um, classroom strategies that have worked for me when I attempt to make sure I am building critical literacy into my teacher education classes and my K through 12 classes. I have used several of these in my K through 12. Um, raft is a really cool way. Some of you might already be familiar with rafting and you know, allowing students to consider new roles, new audiences, new formats um, in their writing. And that's something that can easily be done with K through 12 students. And again, in the resource guide, I provide you a link to each one of these as like a starting point for how do I do it. Sit on it is a really, really good way to do K through 12 critical literacy. Um, I notice I wonder. I love this one so much. I give my students a photograph, maybe a historical photograph. Um, we use the Dust Bowl because um, I'm from Oklahoma. And so a lot of what my students had to learn revolved around the Dust Bowl. But instead of just doing the typical textbook exploration of the Dust Bowl, I would give them a historical photograph of migrant workers during the Dust Bowl. And they would do, I notice, I wonder, where they would list all the facts, things that they could point to. I notice that the children look scared. I notice that the woman is by herself. And then they start to develop their, I wonder. I wonder why there's no man present in the picture. I wonder why they look so scared. And this is where they learn to question and interrogate the text. Um, PBL, problem-based learning, also referred to as project-based learning. Um, so many great resources that are out there. Um, and I'm not gonna go through each of these because I know you all have specific questions. I would much rather um, engage in your questions and field specific information that you would like to know. Um, but again, these are some classroom strategies, tangible classroom strategies that you can do with your teacher education programs but also these are things that can happen in a K through 12 classroom. And again, those are provided for you in the resource guide. So when it comes to revising your own ELA practices, I highly encourage you first to find your own so what. For me, I've done some exploration into my own students, my students in Texas, my students at the HSI, and my own personal and professional background. All those things guide my so what. I want to meet my students where they're at. I want to meet my students and their needs. And I also want to make sure that I'm meeting the guidelines that the state might give me, that my university might give me, that my college might give me, but I'm doing it in an authentic way. My students always come first, and then I can layer in those other expectations, and those all kind of make up my so what. So I want you to find your own so what. Then choose a framework that you would like as your starting point, as your foundation, and then start layering in instructional strategies. Remember, we have to have a starting point. That does not mean you have to do a complete overhaul of your curriculum. Find a couple of things that you could layer in. Ask yourself, how am I disrupting the commonplace and what kind of instructional strategies could I use to do that? And maybe just layer in two and then hit the next part and then hit the next part. Maybe each semester as you go or as you build a network of um, maybe a team that wants to do this together. So that's how I suggest that you revise it with those three steps. Find your so what build your foundation with a framework and then start layering in instructional strategies. So as promised, I am giving you a resource guide. In this resource guide, it has the scholars that we talked about. It has um, some kind of go-to what is, what is, what are, ooh, I'm in a room full of English people and I just butchered that terribly. Um, but there's tons of resources for you in the resource guide. I include the frameworks. Um, the links in there are, 
um, you can click them and it'll take you to a whole new page. And then there are other things that are just kind of a list of things that are go-tos. I've provided all the instructional strategies for you that you can tap into. And I know Susie, who is helping facilitate the webinar, has the link to this resource guide that she's going to share with you in the chat box. And that makes things much easier for you if you don't have a QR um, code scanner, you don't know how to do the QR code, or maybe you wrote down the bit.ly wrong, um, you should be able to just tap on the link in the chat box and it'll take you straight to that resource guide that you can download and keep. So I'm gonna stop doing a screen share right now and kind of rejoin you in the Zoom and allow us to kind of explore some of these questions. Kim, do you want to read the questions to me or do you want me to just go through them? Yep, let's um, give some time for folks to ask some questions now that they have the resource. We had a lot of comments in the chat of um, everyone appreciating uh, your sentiments and sharing some of them. Um, so now if everyone would love to take a minute um, and share any questions you have uh, based after, uh, um, after hearing Dr. Meyer's presentation. We'll take a moment and see what comes up. Yeah, I appreciate a lot of these questions or comments. I don't see any questions yet, but I appreciate a lot of the comments. Um, one of the things that really helps my students develop questions is to consider um, if I was to share this with someone, what is one big takeaway that I should, or how do I start developing my network or my allyship when it comes to doing critical literacy? And so that's something you can be considering when it comes to the questions. Uh, Laura asks, how are you talking to future teachers about the kinds of challenges to CRT that are exploding in school board meetings? Um, okay, so um, things that I probably shouldn't say out loud, but I'm a huge fan of Neil Postman's book, Teaching as a subversive activity <laughs> um, and he talks a lot about when we know what's best for our students learning to meet the expectations of the school district while also doing what is best for our students right and so that is a book that i often encourage my students to purchase is teaching as a subversive activity um, and then also i talk to my students about even if this wasn't happening with CRT being under attack, um, I always tell my students that they need to allow their students to construct their own knowledge and to collaborate, right? And so we want our students to be able to speak up in class. And so I will often give my students some umbrella prompts. We might read something and I'll say, okay, based on your lived experiences, what are some major issues you feel like are important that maybe this text address or it doesn't address and that it allows my students to start bringing up some issues that they have faced and so instead of me saying okay today we're going to learn about social justice um, they are bringing injustices that they've either experienced or they've seen or that they're just really wanting to talk about and so now it's student-led and it's not me um, and so that's a big component of it but we all know crt is not being taught in K through 12 schools. Yeah, critical race theory is something that we often don't learn about until grad school. And so when I have, I have had educators come at me and say, well, what do you think about critical race theory being taught in a K through 12 schools? And the first thing I ask them is tell me one critical race theory scholar. Who have you learned about? What have you been learning about critical race theory? And oftentimes it's difficult for them to even tell me who, you know, is writing about critical race theory. And then also um, I asked them, so share with me some lesson plans that you've seen that are critical race theory lesson plans. <laughs> and that doesn't happen either. And so those are kind of the ways that I am trying to deal and support my future teachers and learning how to speak a language, um, understanding the administrators or people who might oppose those. Um, Looking at other questions that we might have, a question I've encountered lately is resistance to active learning strategies, like those you described to support CRT because other educators believe that the sage on the stage approach to teaching writing is just a teaching personality or style and not essential to English language development. I wonder what you might say or how you might push back 
when those of higher rank than you dismiss the kill and drill strategies you've described as harmful to students at the college level? I'm so glad you asked this question because I've experienced this firsthand, um, not only uh, in the K through 12 setting, but definitely at the college setting. Because when we do these active learning strategies, um, for example, the digital storytelling, a lot of academics feel like that's fluff. But when I pull the standards and I pull the learning objectives and I pull Bloom's taxonomy, I can show those other educators that my students are actually working at a higher level than their students are working. And so that is some of those resources. That's one reason why I shared the ILA and the NCTE standards with you all, because when you show them, look, this national organization who is telling us the best way to approach teaching and writing is telling us to include critical thinking and active strategies and those types of things. But also if we look at blooms, you know, while your students might just be regurgitating facts or at the bottom, they're just barely identifying, they're just barely comprehending. My students are evaluating, my students are analyzing, and they're not only doing it with academics, they're doing it with the world around them. So that's kind of one of the ways that I do it is to pull up blooms and be like, this is where my students are learning. These are the standards that we are meeting. Um, and I focus on the skills. So I've had, um, I've had some academics question before things like exit tickets, right? And um, as fluff. And so I will use exit tickets and then I will pull the skills that the students are having to use to develop those exit tickets before I leave my class. So when I pull the verbs, so the analyze, the create, the formulate, those types of things, it really helps kind of get them to back down. And I love that you asked that question, Jackie, too, because I actually teach my future teachers how to do this. We do elevator pitches and we pretend like we have gotten in the elevator and we have different roles. So maybe a principal walked in the elevator with you. Maybe a PTA mom walked in the elevator with you. Maybe your department chair walked in the elevator with you and they have critiqued you and questioned you over what well, I heard the other day in class, students were doing essays that involved photographs. That's not an essay. And so they practice giving an elevator pitch using their empowered language of standards and Bloom's taxonomy and verbiage to give like a quick 30 second, here's why moment. So yeah, lots of role playing <laughs> in a perfectly appropriate educational way. Any other questions that you all have? I see, so I see some in the chat box, but there's another Q and A. Oh, Nancy just said thank you. Well, if you have any questions, feel free to open up that resource guide. In the resource guide, I include my email, I include my Twitter handle. If you think of questions that you have later, please, by all means, feel free to reach out. Um, I am a huge fan of the dialogical learning. I am a huge fan of reciprocal learning. And when you reach out to me and ask questions, we have the opportunity to learn together. And if I can't answer your questions, it gives me the opportunity to say, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm gonna find somebody who does. Um, someone said, how do we get the resource guide? If, um, let's see, Susie, do you mind sharing the link one more time um, in the chat box for Betty? There you go, Betty, there is a link right there. If you click on that, it will take you to the resource guide and you can download it um, to the computer. It says, um, Laura says, the Moms of Liberty group is worth watching out for the book banning in the name of protecting kids for discomfort. Absolutely, things to look out for. And I think, so this was one of my frustrations. Um, I had my first child at 16. Clearly I was not a good kid, a good kid. Um, I was a troublemaker, right? And so, but so many of our teachers become teachers because they're good students. They enjoy following the rules. They enjoy listening and learning. And sometimes I feel like that gets us into trouble as a profession because we're scared to speak up. We're scared to advocate for ourselves and engage with our own agency as teachers. And so I love that you bring up that whole like Moms for Liberty group because we need to be aware of those things and we need to be speaking up 
um, whether it be with our governments or our school districts or our administration. Dr. Myers, thank you so much uh, for sharing a little bit more about yourself today and your work. Um, I know it has inspired many of us as we go back in and um, do our own work um, to continuously uh, ask ourselves questions as we're doing our work and our why. Um, Thank you. Um, and thank you, Branchhead community, for joining us today. Um, our next event is coming up um, on February 2nd, and we would love to see you there. Um, there is a link in the chat, um, and there is a QR code on the screen. Um, if you want to register for our next webinar. It's on February 2nd at 12 p.m. CT, 1 p.m. ET with Dr. Louis Rodriguez, who's the interim dean and professor in the Graduate School of Education at the University of California, Riverside, and he'll be presenting on the Praxis of Recognition. So you can join via the link in the chat or use the QR code on the screen. We would love to see you there. We would also love to hear about your experience today. So there's a short poll that I'll be launching um, and would love to get your feedback on today's webinar. Thank you so much. I see them coming in. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here today. And thank you again, Dr. Myers, for sharing your work with us. We just really appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>